My name is Stephanie Purseller. I'm the Sustainability Manager here at Moraine Valley Community College. My office is right back there by Tish, L242. Tish is one of our lovely librarians as well. Um, and uh, that office is a resource to you um, as students, staff, and faculty who want to learn more about sustainability. We also host our Go Green Club in that office um, Thursdays at 3 p.m. So if any of you are interested in learning more, getting in involved, et cetera. Uh, this event is part of our Earth Month. So Earth Day is April 22nd. We try to do events throughout the month to try to engage people in understanding about sustainability. So this event is part of that programming. Um, what you're going to learn today is uh, some a lot of heavy information. And so what I, I encourage you to do as students, I know you already know how to do this, is keep your eyes and mind open and think. And then listen to the questions you're asked. And then please participate. I'll be walking around with the microphone. If you have questions, please participate. OK? Um, so Troy Swan Dr. Troy Swanson is our chair of the library. Uh, he is um, uh, a world of knowledge. Um, all of our librarians are, actually. So whenever you have questions, also I would encourage you, if you have questions for any research topic, regardless of sustainability or whatnot, that circle desk over there is a fantastic resource for you. So please use it. Otherwise, sorry, I had to make that plug. Uh, so Troy Swanson is going to talk to us about climate change and the mechanics of skepticism. Think about that word. How can we know better? So without further ado. <laughs> Thank you. You know, bring the microphone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, thanks. And I'm going to hide this stand away once we take it. You got it? Okay. All right. Well, it is nice to see everyone. Way more uh, folks than I thought might be here, so this is, this is good. Thank you to our faculty who brought classes. Um, we're going to talk about a, a lot of things today. Um, we're going to cover a lot of ground, starting with climate change, and then we're going to transition a little bit. So I just want to run through some information about climate change. Perhaps you have heard of this phenomenon, right, that's happening. Um, some different levels. I see some heads nodding, right? So this is, this is the basics of what's going on, right? Um, the Earth is warm because we have an atmosphere that holds in um, uh, greenhouse gases that keeps us warm. So that's why we're not the moon. That's why we're not Mars, where it gets very cold and, atmos and, and heat goes away. The problem is, due to choices that we've made in the way that we've lived, uh, mostly with industrialization, is we are pumping way more gases than should be in the atmosphere. And so the heat, instead of a, a healthy amount is escaping and a healthy amount is staying in, more is being absor absorbed into um, our planet, right? So that is the 40 second overview of how um, the greenhouse effect and climate change is happening. But um, we are getting you know, big flashing red warning signs from the scientists across the globe, um, specifically led by the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, saying, hey, we are on the way to 1.5 degrees of warming. Once we start getting towards two degrees of warming globally, we are getting to some effects that we are not going to be able to pull back, right? Like we are already at 1.5, losing the ability to, to just go back to where we were. So now we're going to have to live with the changes that are with us already. And they're saying, hey, we need to do some things to change how we live or we're going to be in trouble, right? Frying ourselves away. Um, like bacon. So I want to talk a little bit about just like what climate change is and we, we this seems like a new thing like this, the, the flashing signs have been going off but the, the ideas in climate change is a long evolving growing science. This is not new at all and like any piece of science that you study you can go back through history and find the moments where pieces start to fall together and the light bulbs start going off. Stretching with this case all the way back into the 1800s Right, so we're on the way to 200 years of knowledge relating to um, how the Earth's climate works, from documenting how, the, 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 how heat is held onto the Earth starting in 1824, noting um, CO2 levels, um, all the way up to 1972, where the first government panel was put together under um, President Nixon, thinking about the impact of what climate change can do to us, right? So I won't bother you to read all of these, but I just want to point out, right, that these are, are not new pieces that are all falling together. Um, so I want us to think about, like, how do we know about climate change? What can we study? How do we get this, this um, knowledge that scientists are using to, to wave these flags? 
And I want to point out two different, two different angles on this, right? The things that we can measure and see how change is happening. And then when we observe around the world, what do we expect to see? And are we seeing that, right? So it's kind of like running a test. What do we think we're going to see? And is it there, right? And, and uh, so let's just do a few of these. So the measurements, the core thing are these greenhouse gases. So CO2 is the main one that we see. But there's methane. There's a few of them that have this effect. So number one is that we are watching the increase. We can document that CO2 is going up. There is no doubt about that, right? And if we go back in time, so looking at ice core samples, um, ice from, from uh, tops of mountains, whatever, um, you can, we can also get estimates on what um, CO2 used to look like in the past, so we can make some comparisons. Connected to that, then, is temperatures. So temperatures are most clearly rising. There is no doubt. Um, low temperatures are hotter than they used to be. High temperatures are hotter than they used to be. All the way up. You can see the going back to 1880, the data that we have. It's, it walks its way up, up the chart. Um, our oceans are also warming, clearly. And the, the oceans are actually absorbing most of the heat that's going on, which should be a big concern, right? The bottom core of the, of the whole food chain comes out of the oceans. So if that becomes um, unstable as it is, then it could have ripple effects across um, things for the rest of us. Um, everywhere we look. So being good scientists, what we should look to do is to disconfirm our beliefs. If we were going to go somewhere that would make us change our minds, where is the data that would make us do that? Can we, can we show that our measurements are wrong? And, and everywhere we look, we're not changing our minds. We're actually finding more and more data that supports these measurements. So let's talk about the, the things that we would expect to see, right? So if the Earth was actually warming, what things would we see? Um, so number one is we're seeing um, ice sheets uh, across land are just going away, right? They are melting, having impact. Um, number two, the Arctic sea ice, it, it grows and shrinks based on the time of year. Um, it is getting smaller at all times of year. So these are the, the, when you see the pictures of the starving polar bears, right? This is the, the result um, coming from that. Um, glaciers, so not just like in a few places. Every glacier that you go to around the world is smaller than it was 100 years ago. Um, no doubt on that. I did not take these pictures, so these are just uh, some documentation of a glacier. I think this might be um, Glacier Bay out of um, Alaska, perhaps. Um, but every mountain range, every glacier. If you want to go to um, Glacier National Park, part of the National Park Service, um, you should go soon because there may not be glaciers left in Glacier National Park. Um, Sea level rise, we are documenting, right? Um, inch by inch, the sea is getting, um, is going up. And of course, like a great um, amount of our population live on some sort of waterfront. Um, that's sort of left over from history, but also just economics and food and all of that, right? We live around water because we need water. Um, we aren't all going to live in the desert. So that has huge impact on populations uh, globally. Um, weather events, so if you think of wildfires, you think of hurricanes, you think of um, like the, the polar what, bomb hurt thing that just hit Denver area, right? Everything, these are, some of these are natural occurrences, but we're seeing them be exaggerated and stronger because of the impacts of climate change. And so this translates into money, right? So when you have a huge hurricane like Hurricane Sandy wipe out New Jersey, then who pays to rebuild all of that stuff? Or um, Katrina hitting New Orleans, right? That is us our tax money going to recover um, those cities and build levees and try to protect as much as we can. Um, so this is from the UN, from the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, saying, hey, we've got some choices, right? So there's a, the, the temperatures are going up, and they've, they've made some marks. Oh, I think I actually have like a laser, right? So we can decide if we do nothing, we're going to end up up here. So these are going to be extreme, really ugly, even worse kinds of things. If we take action, we can try to level it off. So notice it's not... So that's up through 2022, 2040. It's still going to keep warming. Even if we stopped right now, there's enough greenhouse gases that the warming will continue. We just have to decide how do we flatten it, can we flatten it. Notice it's only barely going back down. So this is what we're, what we're living with. Um, there are loud voices trying to get in into the debate. Most notably is Al Gore. He's probably the leading figure saying, hey, we've got to do something. I kind of like this quote. We've got to stop treating um, the Earth's atmosphere as an open sewer, right? So we're just dumping our leftovers um, from production into, into the Earth. And of course, on the other side, um, we're seeing vocal people such as our president. And actually, this is a good quote, just that 
it sort of represents what the opposition to climate change is saying, right? Most people that are climate skeptics anymore, who are reasonable people, are not saying that warming isn't happening. Almost everyone is saying that warming is happening. Not, not totally everyone, um, but, they're, but what they're saying is, hey, it's happening, but it's not man-made. So we can't do anything about it, so we might as well just keep on trucking how we've been doing it, right? So this was just from October of this past year, right when the UN was issuing its most dire warning about climate change. Uh, President Trump was on 60 Minutes saying, hey, you know, everything, I, I don't think it's too bad. It seems like it's a hoax. Um, so one of the big problems when we think about what can we know about climate change is that we, it, we're kind of in a bad situation knowledge-wise, right? Like a good scientific experiment would let us do a test and compare it to something else, right? So you like run like a drug test, right? You're going to give some people a fake drug, give some people the real drug, and see who gets healthy. But the problem with climate change is I can't take one earth and we just keep on pumping CO2 into it, and then have another Earth that we make changes, and we see which, which Earth comes out better, right? We have one Earth, we have to make one choice, and we have to all work together to do it. So what this data really looks at is it's a correlational data, right? Look, there's more CO2. Look, warming is happening. Look, we can see ice sheets going away. None of these things actually are the kind of like medical proof that we would use to approve a new kind of drug. It's just things that are too coincidentally working together to, 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 to deny, right? And our scientists do have mo Earth models, globe models, where they're running um, experiments trying to see what they can change, what they can't change. But this is a knowledge problem, so it's really easy for us to deny climate change because it's not like we can just run a definitive test. We have to say, hey, it's the future, we think this is gonna happen. And that's a big challenge for all of us because it requires sacrifices on kind of hesitant, tentative grounds. Um, so, you know, we have to think like, what can we know? How can we know this? Um, so I'd like to just do a pause, and I have a question for you, and Stephanie has a microphone, I'd like to get some feedback. So after that quick 15-minute fly through climate change, what's going on in your head? How are you feeling right now after having this conversation? One person at a time, please. It's pretty shocking that uh, once it reaches like, what's called like, two degrees, uh, what's it called is it Celsius higher, mm -hmm. then that we can't change it. But um, I'm just confused on like how myself I'm able to make a difference. You know what I mean? Like how am I like like my like, as so a confused on what you would do to make yeah, a what would I do? Yeah, like to make a difference. It's right. called to level it out. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I'm not gonna answer that question now because that'll take us in a whole different direction. But good. Other rea I'm just want to get some reactions. So good confusion. Um, yes, sir. She's got the mic coming so we can hear. Personally, I'm surprised. I'm, I'm moving to Fort Lauderdale in August, and <laughs> I just thought we're going to be on water boat. <laughs> right. pretty <Yeah>. soon. <laughs> right. Yeah, so surprise. Okay. Good. Um, I think it's interesting that you brought up the rising water level because in another class, we just discussed a film in which you had people who were still suffering from a flood that had happened and they had been driven out of their homes and they had to try to go back and rebuild their lives because um, mm -hmm. like the government, they just instead of like helping them rebuild, they just like told them to just like leave and go into a shelter. Right, yeah, okay. So it's kind of connecting to things that you've seen in other courses, right? Yeah, so good, good. Is, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I think the first thing to address is that everyone has to be on the same page in order to say that this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, m the most common problem is that m not everyone understands that climate change is a problem and it needs to be addressed. Yeah. But then again, there's people like me or like people like all of us that really have very little effect on what we can do. It's mm -hmm. not like I own a big company with, you know, that's really polluting yeah, the earth. I don't do that. I own a small little car. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. So I think we all own small little cars. I drove <laughs> here by myself today, right? Did everyone, anyone carpool or take a bike today? Yeah, yeah maybe a couple. All right, but buses. Yeah. When looking at the bigger picture, I don't think it's about what we can change. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course, it's the little things, but it, it really has to go with the bigger picture and the people who are in charge, for example, President Trump. Right. And once we get him on the same page and other political, um, not only 
senators and all that, like, and people who own those big companies that are actually polluting the earth in order to create a change that way, I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything that we so can, can really I, do. So I want to ask about how you're feeling about it. Are, d so there's this frustration that you feel? Is this, um, it's, it's or not just like, I don't, like, just like I'm, I'm surrendering, it's not, I'm, it's not on me, I'm done. It's not necessarily frustration. For me, I know it's a thing and I believe that it's a thing and any mm -hmm. law that will be passed in order to help um, prevent any further climate change from happening, I will be for. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, I'm gonna be dead soon, in a couple <laughs> years, you know what I mean? <laughs> in, in a couple years, we all will. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's yeah. not really our problem. Right. Um, but at the same time, yeah. you know. You so that's know, part of the issue, right? Yeah. It's easy to kick it down the road. Like, it how is, much do it we is. care? Yeah. It's, not, it's not really our. Yeah. Right. Is there anyone. It, so if you, I, I will ask for a brave person who maybe is more on the skeptical side of this. And it's fine. Like, there's, this is open. You clearly know where I stand, who would be willing to say how they felt just hearing me talk this through. And if not, that's okay. Yeah, so thinks climate change, like he's more um, believing um, President Trump's words. Or that other skeptics. That is not man-made. Yeah. Hoax, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. I just wanted to ask. Okay. Let's see where people fall. Cool. Okay, so for the sake of time, I want to keep it. So thank you for that. We're, there'll be a few more things coming up. So I just want to point out, like, any time that you, that when, when we talk about this, this is my, in my guess, right, that there's going to be a, a spectrum of people in here on how you fall. So some of you are going to be more on the hardcore believer side. Like if you're, especially some of you that are in environmental classes, that you've heard of some of this, like this is, I, like you're with me. Yes, yes, Troy, I am with you. Keep preaching. Go for it, brother, right? Some of you are going to be like, dude, this dude, whatever, like why the hell am I listening to a librarian talk about climate change? Like this is just a problem to begin with. Um, I'm skeptical, and there's some of you that are going to be in the middle, like I'm here because uh, Applequist made me come here, I have no idea really what I'm doing here, I don't care about this, and it's almost lunchtime, so, right, and then you're kind of neutral, like, okay, I'm, I'm listening, this is okay, but, you know, in the middle, right, and that all of you are going to fall into this spectrum um, somewhere, so some people are going to have these emotional reactions, or some of you maybe even might be like, I kind of believe in climate change, and I've never heard, like, such a clear pointed argument, right? Now I get it. Like I sort of got it before, but now I'm with it. And some of you are going to be like, I'm kind of maybe with it. I don't know. But we all have these kind of emotional feeling reactions as we're absorbing new information. And so this is the thing that I really want to talk about today, even though we're starting out talking about climate change, is how can we not agree on climate change, right? Is climate change happening is a scientific question. There is a yes or a no to that. There is evidence, there is data, and we can look at that data and we can make a choice. So how can there be disagreement? How can we not just come together and say, this is a problem, let's all go buy hybrid cars and let's not eat meat anymore because the meat industry is really awful for um, our climate. And then that will make a huge impact on, on our future and our kids' future, right? Um, how can we not see? So this is, the, this is the core that we're at. What are these mechanics? How can we not just agree? So I want to start with a quiz. There's, this is, there's, no, there's no grade. It's even not really a quiz. Really just four questions. I want to, we'll get some answers. I want you to think about these. Don't shout out the answers at, right away. We'll let people think about them. So the first question. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. Okay, you're going to have to do a little math thinking. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So get that answer in your head. Is there anybody who would like to volunteer an answer? If you've heard this one before, don't ruin it right away. How much does the ball cost? 10 cents. Does anyone have a d different answer than 10 cents? You have a different answer. Don, you're out of this one. What's your answer? Okay, so we have 10 cents versus 5 cents. Can you explain the 5 cent answer? Can you give him the microphone so we can all hear? Hold that thought. Can you explain it? Yeah, uh, okay, wait, she's coming. She, okay, good. Go ahead. So I read a book where this question is in it. Ah, <laughs> uh, cheater. Uh, okay. But, so exp explain it to us. That's good. That's fine. So I, I got it wrong. The That's first the benefit time I of knowledge, too. right there. Yeah. Yes. I got it wrong the first time I heard it too. So it's yeah, good. Yeah, it's, it's crafted in a way where they, it's just kind of built that we have these, um, 
I guess weaknesses in our mind yeah. when we look at things and right. we want to which is what we're we going to think about. it through all the way. Yeah. Like once so you do the help math us think it through. Can you explain how the, the math actually works on this? Yeah, I mean, a dollar five plus five cents gives you one ten. Right. And it's a dollar more. And if you did ten and a dollar, which is for whatever reason the natural reaction. Yeah. It's one twenty. Yeah. So. So if it is ten cents, what would the what would the bat cost? A dollar ten, because the, the bat's a, do, a dollar more, right? What is one ten plus ten cents? A dollar twenty. So that means they couldn't cost a dollar ten in total, right? So it can't be ten cents, because a dollar ten plus ten cents is a dollar twenty. If I had a board, it'd be easier to write this on the board, right? But if the bat, if the ball costs a nickel, that would make the bat cost a dollar five. Five cents plus a dollar five is a dollar ten. So that's the correct answer. The ball costs five cents. So everyone get that? No. So no. All right. So the core thing is the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. So the ball costs five cents. That means the bat would have to cost a dollar five. A dollar five plus five cents is a dollar ten. So this is a problem where most people will get it wrong when we do it first. I got it wrong. But in a crowd this size, I would probably say there's there'd be ten of you, five of you that'll get it right. And if we all just left and locked all of you up in this room, after about 20 minutes, everyone would agree. Like right now, is there anyone that doesn't, if I, I could, it'd be easier if I did it on the board, right? But if I did that math, everyone will agree on that math, right? It's, it's an answer that's a well-structured problem. We can make sense on how it works, right? So this is how we think climate change should work. Um, but our brain does something weird with this, right? Our brain likes subtraction. So we see a dollar ten, we see a dollar, what do we do? Subtract it ten cents. We think it's a simple subtraction problem, right, that like my, you know, my daughter who's in fifth grade would be able to, you know, do this with. Um, so another question. So this uh, takes us another step. Highly intelligent women often marry less intelligent partners. Why? It's easy. Okay. It's, 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 uh, we don't have to put that on a microphone. I'll just repeat it. The comment was, it's easier to get what you want. Easier to get what you want because you're smarter than the other people? Yeah, okay. It's, He's, if he's a teacher and likes to teach, the, teach those partners, what's up? Yeah, why else? Yeah, he's good. Do you know this one too? Yeah, I do. Okay, um, tell us. <laughs> We're working together. So statistically, say, I don't know, you're in the 99th percentile of intelligence. There's yep. not that big of a pool of people for you to choose from, right? Because you're yeah. smarter than yeah. almost everyone. And practically speaking, right. you don't want to die alone. So, <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to date people who aren't as smart as them, and, you know, <laughs> unless that's your only criteria, and then everyone is almost exactly as intelligent as their partner. That's, it's not a single variable world that we live in, so. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll go to the handheld. Yes, so the thing with this, this is a trick, right? This is a math question. This is not actually about women or partners or anything. But when I put the word woman, this is true for men too, highly intelligent men marry less intelligent partners. But when I make it, if I just say highly intelligent people, it's less charged. So if I put the word woman in there, everyone brings, they carry with this baggage. And I, I often hear, you know, women don't want whatever, like there's all these excuses, right? So which we heard of. We fill in the blanks and interpret something here that isn't here. This is just math. On average, all highly intelligent people are going to marry less intelligent partners. Now, there's probably some super smart people that marry other super smart people because that's just, they, they happen to find each other. Um, but on average, it's just not true, right? So this is math, but we don't see it as math. Um, so this one is a little easier for everyone. There is no right answer. Uh, select a pen. If, if I just had to ask you, which pen would you take? They're, they both write the same. Um, they write black. These are just like giveaway pens that the library had. One is green, one's kind of a grayish charcoal co color. Who would take the green pen? If I made you pick, who would take the other charcoal pen? Right? Okay. There is nothing in this that there's, there is absolutely no reason or logic behind this, right? This is a d decision that just comes from somewhere in here, right? That I just uh, feel like green today. I'll take the green. Just like when you, if you couldn't make that decision, like this is a core decision that humans have to make, not just about pens, but about everything. Like if I had to, when I got dressed this morning and I decided I'm gonna wear this blue shirt, if I had to write out a cost-benefit analysis, like it's, it's Thursday and 
you know, maybe, you know, we're, we're about, there's a, like, um, Easter holidays coming for some of us. Maybe I need something blue. It kind of feels spring. You know, I can't spend 45 minutes, like, writing out why I want to wear this shirt today. I just need to wear a freaking shirt, grab one out of my closet. I feel like blue. Done, right? That's how we make most of our decisions. Most of our decisions aren't this, like, this um, logical front of the brain process. It's things behind the scenes that we see, and we make a choice, and we grab it, and we go. So that's also sort of why when you're like, you know what, I'm on this diet, and I am not going to have that hot fudge Sunday. I'm going to drive by Dairy Queen on my way home, and today I am not going to stop. Then it gets to be like 5 in the afternoon, and it's been a long day. It's been rough here in the library for me, and I see that Dairy Queen, and I'm like, oh, you know, I could sure go for that hot fudge Sunday. And there, the logic is losing to the more primal parts of the brain, right? The brain overrides it. But that's where a lot of our decisions come from. There's the, let me give you one more example of this. I'm going to read this to you. One more question. I just want to know, is this okay? And this is a potentially sensitive topic. So I don't mean to, this is not to make light of something serious. Um, but let me read it. This is actually out of the psychology research. So um, students tend to have a reaction to this one. So Julie and Mark are brother and sister. They are traveling together in France on summer vacation from college. One night they're staying alone in a cabin near the beach, and they decide that it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julie was already taking birth control pills, but Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy making love, but they decide to never do it again. They keep that night as a special secret, which makes them feel even closer to each other. What do you think? Is it, was that okay for them to do? It, it, so incest, morally, it's what? Yeah. Morally, it's wrong? Yeah, why? I don't know what it is in France. We'll pretend in France it's not illegal. Go ahead. She's got a microphone. Oh. Um, I think it might be okay because it doesn't say that they made love to each other specifically. Okay, so no, I don't want to be clear on this. They made love to each other. I get that one a lot. Well, this is them that. together. They did it. All right? So that's not up for debate. Is it okay? Yeah, no. No, how come? Because they're siblings. They're yeah, but they said it was fine. They're not telling anyone about it. They thought it was okay. Isn't that okay? They are, they are related. They came from the same mother and father. They actually made love. I want to get all this, the, just the ground out. That's, that's the question. Is it okay? That's not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So that's the reaction that we often get. There's a whole line of moral judgment research in psychology asking these kind of questions. And the reality is, logically, there is nothing wrong with this. From a frontal, rational part of the brain, you, th they've covered everything. They thought it was fine. They never do it again. There's no emotional problems. Okay. But everyone in here is sort of, I can see your faces. Everyone's sort of like, ugh, it just feels creepy, right? It just feels like this is not right. This is not... This, this should not happen. This should not be right. And there's, there's a lot of research that, that shows this, that our brains are programmed, pre-programmed. This is how we come, to not let these kind of relations happen with people that are close to us. There's bad genetic outcomes that happen. There's bad things that happen in families. Um, whatever the reasons are, evolutionarily speaking, we are not programmed to do this. It's sort of like if I gave you a glass of curdled milk and you had to try to drink it, your body will just not let you drink it, right? You will just be puking that stuff up all over the place. That's the same kind of emotional reaction we have to this. And the reason that this is useful for this conversation is this also is a demonstration of another kind of decision-making that our brain makes behind the scenes, where rationally, logically, we, make, we think we should be able to make one decision, but we just don't feel right about it. We're pushed by our brains into another decision that, that comes up, all right? So that's the end of the quiz. Um, out of everything, you know, we're talking about climate change and all these important issues. What often happens is this is the thing that most students will remember. Um, but, right, <laughs> they're like, yeah, they're like, heck yeah, I'll remember this. All right. If you want to go on to study psychology, there's a whole research branch that you could go into where you can ask people these kind of weird questions and get paid for it. So, you know, yay, I see our, you know, psychology faculty who are in here. Um, that could be a good career path. I don't know. Okay, so, you know, I want to outline a few things. We're going to touch back on these questions that I had before, okay? Some things that happen, these mechanisms, the mechanics that go behind skepticism, that go behind our decision-making, more importantly, all right? The, the number one thing that you will hear all the time is this idea of confirmation bias. And if you take which psych, cl which psych class that teaches confirmation bias? Okay, social psychology. Um, 
or Laws and Collins, in, the intro course, okay, fall semester, 10 a.m., come and take it. I don't know, I don't know. Um, uh, so confirmation bias is that we have a tendency to reinforce the beliefs we have, all right? So when we look for information that supports, informa supports the ideas we already have, and we ignore things that my, might help us change our minds. And this is a core thing that we do. It's hard to get around. It's very hard to get around. So if I already am prone to believe that you know, climate change is happening and changing the world, I am more likely to grab onto that information that supports that belief and ignore information that would change my mind, and vice versa. So if I think climate change is not real, then I'm going to ignore it. Uh, I'm going to ignore stuff that might change my mind, and I'm going to hang on to the stuff that, that supports it. There are two components of confirmation bias that I think are worth pointing out, because these are things that we do all the time. So the first one is called selective exposure. So it's clear in our society that certain people, that people with certain political views absorb um, information that connects to their views. So the, you know, if you're um, liberal, you're more likely to listen to MSNBC, and if you're conservative, you're more likely to have Fox News on all the time. And that starts to, un that starts to, to reinforce those beliefs because you're only getting one stream of information. So selective exposure is purposefully just exposing yourself to information that already agrees with what you think. And then the other one then is the other side, defensive avoidance. So if this, ti this, this talk is about climate change, and you really are, um, I think climate change isn't real and you're a, a climate skeptic, you're probably not going to come here in the first place, right? I know some of you were forced to be come here for classes, so maybe you might be forced to come here, but you'll choose, you know, i got other things to do. I don't need to listen to somebody tell me that I'm wrong about things, right? So those two things work together to emphasize um, confirmation bias, and we walk through our world um, reinforcing the things that we, already, that we already believe. So when we go out and try to seek information, we are more likely to look for things and take those first things, do my search on Google, the first thing I come to that I automatically agree with, that's my information source. We tend to not follow good scientific process and try to disconfirm our beliefs. There's a very famous um, philosopher of science named um, Popper, oh my God, what's his first name? Karl Popper, thank you. I've actually read books by him, but I can't remember his first name on this one. Karl Popper's fantastic, and he believes that a true scientist seeks to knock down their beliefs. If you have a belief and you try to disconfirm it, and then you can't disconfirm it, that makes that belief stronger. But what we normally do is this thing called motivated reasoning, where we seek to confirm what we already believe and ignore things that might change our minds. So this is the big takeaway, I think, right, is that your beliefs, the way you see the world, and the way you make decisions are relative to who you are, where you come from, right? So your, who your identity is, your, um, where you live in the world, where you live in history, your um, gender, your sexual orientation, um, your economic status, all of those things become a filter for our world to help us make decisions. And that's how we see the world is through those filters. So every time that you come in contact with a new piece of information, a new topic, that personal life that you have inside of you is interacting with that and helping you make decisions and helping you determine, is this right? Is this wrong? Do I change what I believe? Do I go with it? Do it does it make something I believe stronger? So along with that, right, is that each topic comes charged. I touched this on this a little bit earlier, right, with the climate change stuff. Every topic you are going to fall on that on that spectrum. Some things you don't care a lot about. In fact, I know, like with Krista's speech classes, she purposely has students pick topics that they don't have strong feelings about, so that you're more open-minded as you come into topics and learn and grow, and you're not carrying that baggage with you. It's very common that we see students do papers, and they come in, they say, "I already believe this." and I'm going to find all the information that supports this, and I'm going to write my paper on this without ever really giving ourselves a chance um, to change our minds. Um, when, you are st when you stand strong on a topic, and you have very strong feelings on a topic, there's a lot of weird things that happen um, to you. Now, if you're neutral, it doesn't, it's not quite as strong. One of the things that happens is, is this like rebound, where like, um, if I had someone in here who actually was fairly skeptical, and, or strongly skeptical about climate change, my argument actually may have pushed them, where they're starting to think, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should rethink what I'm thinking on climate change. But right at the point where I said um, cause correlation does not equal causation, and I say, hey, we can't run an experiment. This is not our best knowledge. Those people can rebound back and become even stronger in their beliefs. There's um, a number of studies that show that once a belief is ingrained in you, it's very hard 
to unhinge that belief and to counteract that belief. And it takes big learning moments. It takes seeing the world in a new way. It takes interacting with people who are different from us sometimes for us to actually change our mind and not just hold on to those beliefs. Um, another thing is that we also work in these kind of teams, these, this like tribal society. So if I voted for Trump or I voted for um, Hillary, I, and we start talking about climate change and we start putting these faces into it, right? Now it starts to become charged where I don't care about what the truth is, I just care about winning this debate. So if I'm liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat, it's not about finding the truth, it's about my side's gonna win. I thought instead of putting their faces, I thought about putting like the Cubs and Sox logos up there, so um, same kind of thing. But it's, it's the tendency that I want my team to win and it's built into us, not about trying to find what is the truth, how can we come together to understand, understand this. And then those moments, there are few moments, and you actually mentioned about the, question, the bat and ball question, right? That is set up to cause a conflict. So conflict monitoring is when we come into contact with a, a new topic, and for some reason, it just doesn't quite feel right. Something in our background, something in our heritage, something in how we see the world, doesn't quite touch it right and you start to think do I really think that that's your brain in conflict trying to make a new decision and this is where belief changes start to come from when I change my mind it comes out of a conflict with information if there's no conflict I just keep on going right so a lot of you so just as an example here's that bat and ball question one is a con written for conflict one is not so if I really wanted to test your math skills Sorry, I know it's hard to see at the bottom. I would have asked you the no conflict question at the, at the bottom. A bat and ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1.05. How much does the ball cost? That's easy math. Like that's, I want to know if you can actually subtract. The topped one is weird because I don't actually give you the cost. I give you the difference in cost, right? The bat costs a dollar more. So some of you, there was no conflict. Some of you just did the math. 10 cents, done, math, gone. Some of you were like, this dude's trying to trick me, there's something weird here, but you know what, I'm just gonna do the math 10 cents and I'm done. And then others of you said, this dude's trying to trick me, oh, I see what he's trying to do, and the conflict you saw the actual answer, or you read the book previously and knew the answer to start with, which is fine. Um, so different moments, different times we get information will activate that conflict in different ways, and that's the moment for us to kind of put up a red flag and be like, oh, I should pay attention oh, am I, why am I having this conflict? Should I change my thoughts? Should I explore more? Should I seek out more information? Um, we treat our brains as if we are these recording device computers that make perfectly logical decisions, right? So those four questions, I think, that, I, that were in the middle there, they demonstrate some of the ways that our brains don't work how we think, right? Our brains are lazy, so we, we, we don't really want to put effort into that thinking, like me getting dressed in the morning. I don't really want to do a cost-benefit analysis on what I'm going to wear. Um, we use um, things called heuristics, which save us time. So like that subtraction is sort of an example of a heuristic. Dollar ten minus dollar ten cents. Things we do, modes of thought that we do all the time just come naturally um, to us. And, and emotions are a big part of our reasoning. There's like an emotional echo effect in the background of everything that we do. So how we feel, the mood that we're in, the, the fight that we just got into with, uh, you know, whatever, girlfriends, boyfriends, those will, will lace through how we interact with information and interact with each other. Um, reasoning is especially um, social, and um, the best reasoning comes when we work together in groups, which I want to talk about in a second. A lot of the decisions we make come from down here. They're like gut level, I'm just gonna do it kind of decisions that we don't think about. I think, I'm pretty sure for my psychology faculty, gut level is a technical um, psychology term, right? That's from the gut. That's how a lot of decisions made. And then every so often, our brains intercede in th those gut decisions and override and change what we see and make us think, think differently. Um, and that's where that conflict comes from. I love this, this is just, uh, if you look, stare at this, most people see motion in this. This is from a psychologist from Japan. Nothing is actually moving, but it can drive your eyeballs nuts, right? You guys see that in there? Like there there's like a feeling. And, and this is just a demonstration that our brains actually construct the world. Like we are not just recording what we see. Our brains are predicting and anticipating things that are around us and building a construction of the world 
um, that, that it uses, which is super useful, right? It's really good. If it doesn't do that, we're in trouble. But the brain can only handle so much, and it can only process so much. And this is, there's all kinds of illusions like this where it'll mess with you. This is just a visual um, construction. So. so the question is, right, are our brains broken? Like, why, how did we get to this point where we are pro arguably the dominant species on the planet, so dominant that we're destroying the planet, if we make decisions so poorly, right? If we can't use logic to get to where we need to be, um, what's wrong with us? And I want to present some thoughts on that. This is my argument that I think is important. And th this comes from um, Hugo um, Mercier and Dan Sperber. They're two um, psychologists who I think a lot of, they're really good. Um, and that when we make decisions, our decision-making apparatus in our brain actually evolved in a group context, right? We are made to live with other people. And, and historically, for most of our existence, up through the last, whatever, 15,000 years since, since agriculture and cities have hit, 100,000 years, most of our existence, we actually lived in small tribal bands of people that we were related to that we trusted deeply, right? And their argument is that reason is an evolutionary tool. And we're actually good at, at judging the reasons of other people. So we're really, really good at just choose, seeing when people are trying to fool us, trying to find weaknesses in other people's argument. We have a real skill for that. Do you know when we're really, really bad? Judging our own arguments. We are really bad at judging if we're right or if we're wrong because it's hard for us to see outside of our worldview, outside of our identities. Um, so their argument is, Reason works because we grew up with people, we evolved with people that we trust. And the goal is just throw out reasons. We're really good at making reasons. My six-year-old daughter, she can make up reasons for everything. There's a reason for that. I did this because of this. And none of those reasons probably connect to the actual real reasons that we do things. The real reason I got that hot fudge sundae is because my animal brain overrode my logical brain, right? But what I thought was, I had a really long day, and I could really use that hot fudge sundae. That's not the real reason I got the hot fudge sundae. It's like, hey, that's a lot of calories. That sounds good. I really want the fudge, right? That's what it's about. Um, so the goal of reasoning is that together, in trusted groups, we argue it out, and the best reason comes to the top. Unfortunately, today, we don't live in really close, trusted groups. We live in a society of loosely connected groups. I really like my employees, but I, I don't like my employees as much as I like, or, or my coworkers, as much as I like my kids, right, or my parents. So I spend most of my week with people that I'm sort of okay with. No offense, guys. Um, <laughs> right? So we have shifted. <laughs> right? <laughs> so our society has shifted, and now we all as a, as a society have to make decisions. So good decisions come from groups um, of trust. Of trust. Well, I'm going to try to bring some of this home to some points that we can actually use, okay? And we'll get back to climate change in a second. I can see the energy. All right, what time? We're doing good. Deep breath. Okay, here we go. Going back in. So some things that I think are really important for us, especially as becoming new students, um, young adults, most of you looking across the crowd, right? Going out in the world making decisions. The key thing is that you need to recognize these kind of um, knowledge um, beliefs that you carry with you, right? So most of our beliefs about who we are and how people interact are ingrained at the age of like eight. What's the role of men? What's the role of women? Um, what is, how do you make money? Wh where do people live? All of those things are really early on in our society and we bring that with us, right? So someone who was, who was born in another country and then comes to the United States will carry with a whole different perspective on what, um, how people live and how people work. Um, if you grew up in the city versus the suburbs or whatever, right? Older parents, younger parents, all of those things will impact how you see um, how the world works. And we need to be aware of that and think about where does that come from, right? Um, anytime you come into contact with a new inf piece of information uh, and it causes a strong emotional response, that's the time that you should be aware, hey, I'm angry over this, or hey, I'm super happy over this. And those are the times where you're in that charged mode and to consider, am I making a good decision on this? Am I making a bad decision on this? Why am I so um, angry or why am I so happy? So there's, this is from a fact checker book I love that says, hey, if you're checking on something and you get really angry, step back and try to understand what's actually happening. The first time you come in contact with a new topic, 
that new information will be overvalued for inf for uh, compared to everything else. So if you were here and you really knew nothing about skepticism or skepticism, nothing about um, climate change, that my first little talk about climate change will become the foundation of all the knowledge you have after it on climate change. So when you come into a new topic, you're kind of you have your guard down. It takes a lot of reading. You need to go to multiple sources because you don't want to just hold on to that one thing you hear. This is how. Um, uh, conspiracy theories grow and thrive, right? So the Illuminati living in a cave somewhere in France really runs the whole world. Like, no. Um, George Bush did not cause 9-11 to happen. No. Um, there's all these, like, who killed JFK? Um, a little information, you get that conspiracy theory, um, it gets ingrained, and it's hard um, to shake that out. We are really bad at thinking all by ourselves. So it's kind of good that we're in classes together, and hopefully we're in classes with people that think differently from us, right? And that we share those interactions. But if you're, you know, on Facebook making these big decisions, and I'm going to share this, and I'm going to debate you, Facebook is a really bad place um, to be making decisions. It's loose connections. It's not um, trusted groups that come together and uh, make make choices. And Krista's laughing because she knows I'm. Uh, she's friends with me on Facebook, so she knows all the stuff that I post on Facebook. So that's. Full disclosure, called out on that one. So, It also, I think, should help us as college students think about what it means to be an expert. So often when we do research, um, the whole goal that we're after, right, is that we're pushing you to find experts to write your papers, to give your speeches, um, people that know more than us. Uh, expertise isn't just like knowing stuff, right? Being an expert in a field is understanding how a field works, understanding what information is really strong? What information is really weak? Understanding how your own theories fit into that thing. And ultimately, um, thinking about, oh wait, you know what, I'm gonna get ahead of myself. Hold that thought. Um, there is a gut level feeling that experts get about if something is right or something is wrong because they've internalized all of the work, all the research that they've done. The real expertise in a field, so like for my, like my psychologists are in the back, the real expertise in the, in the field of something like psychology would be all of the psychologists on Earth. That's where the expertise lives. But we don't get to talk to all of them at once. We get one person in a class. We get another person in a class. And they help us interface with that overall, um, overall field, right? OK, two things that I hope that we can um, walk away with, right? Intellectual humility. This is just the idea that we could be wrong. Too often, we just think we're always right, and we're going to argue about it, and we're not going to change our mind. So this is the thing that we hope that in through college you recognize, hey, sometimes I need to change my mind. You know why? Because sometimes I'm wrong. And then also information empathy. So if you see someone that disagrees with you, your job is not to argue with them until they change their mind, but to try to understand why they think how they, how they think. So that when you, you're, they may show you that your views are wrong, but you also may come up with new ideas, right, that really good interaction that we hope happens at college of sharing ideas and getting a deeper understanding of who we are and where we're going, right? So I have this fear that there's such a divide in our society that we don't believe anything, right? That we just think, oh, I can find any information I want on the internet. If I believe this, I can find someone to, whatever crazy thing I, you know, Bigfoot is real, I can find the Bigfoot Believer website. All the Bigfoot spottings across America, you can find them all on the internet. Um, I worry that we think all evidence is faked, no one can be trusted. And that starts to undermine all of the work that we're trying to do in building our society, and hopefully as a democracy, making decisions together. Um, this core idea of scholarship is that together we can measure our world and understand it. Like that's the thing, we can go out in the world and we can take measurements, whether it's a survey of other people, whether it's rainfall totals, whatever discipline you're working in, we can come together and we can interpret what those mean and make our measurements better, but that the actual knowledge comes from the values we hold and the conversations that we have. That, that, that um, scholarship is a conversation. That's how we work as scholars at a college in education, right? That we should be sharing ideas and growing ideas, not trying to always win the debate. And I, I hope that this is a thing that you take away from Moraine Valley at some level, not that, that you can carry out into the rest of the world, that it's not just about winning this debate, but really trying to understand um, the truth. So, so when we come back to climate change, um, I think there's some things that we should be thinking about. I mean, number one, there's a lot of unsettled questions in climate change. The fact that the Earth is warming and the fact that humans are causing it 
um, 99% of climate scientists are not debating that anymore. They are totally on board, yes. Can you find a, the outlier? Absolutely, there's a few people that would dis disagree, but almost everyone agrees. The questions are, what are we gonna do? What's the real impact of Earth gonna be, on Earth gonna be? Do we really know what that looks like? There's a lot of debate happening within climate change and there's a lot of good resources that we can go to out there that Stephanie can probably share with us at the end to gain more knowledge and to really evaluate how do we come to these views? So I'd ask all of you, we don't have to answer this question, but thinking back to where you stand in, our, in your knowledge about climate change, how did you get to that? Where did that come from? You know where it comes from for most people? Most people it comes out of a political debate. So I'm a Democrat, all the Democrats think that climate change is a problem, so therefore I'm gonna believe that climate change is a problem. Or I had a faculty member that taught me that. And those aren't necessarily wrong, but I want you to look at the evidence, look at the data, and make your own decision. Is this a problem and what do I do about it is, is gonna be the big question. So, okay, so that's a good point to wrap it up. There's questions, conversation, and I'll say thank you to all of you. I, Shania has the mic, yes, go ahead. Thanks, Roy, so when you go back to how you feel when I first learned about it, so growing up in the islands, on the island of Barbados, so we are below sea level, so by age nine or 10, I was going to sustainability conferences and we just learned that climate change was happening. It was not up for debate. We started to learn how the ocean around us was warming up and the effects of it and trying to prevent it. So for me, I really do feel one, nervous, because I know the direct impact, I have seen it already happening and can happen to my people in the islands. And two, I am upset and angry, the fact that this is even, that we even have the luxury to debate this uh, yeah. as to whether or not this is a reality, because the real impact around the world is huge. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely. It is a privilege that we can even pretend that it's not happening, right? Yeah. Huh. Question up here. here. I'm in a uh, earth science class right now where we were studying uh, glaciation and uh, that prompted me to go on the internet and look up some things that were happening around the world. And there was a guy standing there taking a picture and you could actually see glaciers that were once solid ice and they were falling, pieces of them were falling, you know, off. so they were actually breaking off and it, sh and it was an example of how fast this thing was really happening. The big issue is that now as the, that ice melts, there's more trapped gases that they, they worry that it's gonna start this cascade, that it's really just gonna go, like, go through the roof, that we're gonna really lose it fast, so yeah. Other questions, thoughts? Yes. Um, so I'm going to school to study meteorology, so I kinda have a, a little bit more knowledge than the average of um, global warming, but I just wanted to say that a lot of people miss how the effects of global warming causes, and so a lot of it is weather. So when the Earth is hotter, it creates more energy, which is more energy in our storms, and our hurricanes, tornadoes. So the warmer the Earth is, the more energy the, the weather will have, which is why just last week it snowed, and now the next day, two days later, it's 70 degrees. That huge change is from energy, which is the Earth getting more temperature and causing that energy to happen. And I just want to say I've seen um, senators and elected officials, one particularly from Oklahoma, hold up a snowball and say, look, it snowed like crazy today. What do you mean the earth is warming? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just pointing that out. I probably agree with that. And just really quickly to respond to the young lady who shared, like, as, one, as an individual, we can each do a lot. Like, the amount of we can recycle, the plastic water bottles, less paper, there's so much we can do. Even carpooling, right? Um, Troy mentioned, there is so much that each one of us can do because it's not going to be our elected officials that they will make, they can make a difference on a corporate level, but it's gonna be up to us to kind of preserve and make that change. We had a speaker this week who mentioned that if all of us would choose to go vegetarian one day a week, they would have huge impact on climate change because of the, there's such um, big negative impact from our uh, farming system 
uh, into the environment. So I'd be curious to put our psychology faculty on the spot if there's any thoughts on some of the psych things that I touched on throughout that I probably butchered. Well, very rarely will um, statistics change people's opinions, right, especially if they're formed. And to your point, uh, the young lady who brought up about what can I do individually, it feels, you know, kind of fatalistic. You know, I could ride my bike, but then there's a billion other people driving their cars. Right. Uh, the reality is this, is that while the statistics aren't going to really change people's opinions, what will change is the social norms. So if you are, uh, can get people in your community to, to start biking or white, uh, walking, just in, encourage cycling, or whatever it is, instead of the individual driving the car, people will look to you as the leader and say, hey, this is the normal thing to do, but it takes that one person to actually go ahead and initiate the behavioral change. Hopefully others will follow it. Put it on your social media if you're active in social media, and that will bring about like a new norm, and that's probably what's gonna have the greatest effect. Because in the end, does it really matter? And this is a, que a rhetorical question. Um, does it really matter if we change people's minds about climate change or just the behaviors which ultimately results in a reduction? And I'm just happy with the reduction, so I don't know. Good, Good answer. <laughs> and as another faculty member who teaches about climate change, uh, one of the things that happens is we're really good about scaring people about climate change and we're not good about teaching them what they can do as individuals about it. And so I, I got, I, when we were talking about feelings, I got angry when you spoke because I'm sitting here going, um, no, but that's good because it fed into what Troy was talking about, but it's because when I get assignments from my students, they're like, the government should do this, the government should do it. Well, the thing is, with the corporate uh, response, it's us that buys the products. And if we stop buying them because we're not happy with what the production is doing, things are gonna change. And so we can do things, and I try to give examples of that, but we're much better about scaring people than we are about giving them solutions. And that's part of the, the issue with the topic, I think. You know what I mean? I do everything I can in order, in my opinion, I do everything I believe is right. We, we thank you for being here. Yes, but I just think, I just think change will not happen unless it's taken at a higher level. Because you can talk about it all, you, I can talk about it all I want. I can sit here and tell you guys, please use reusable Tupperware and use your um, water bottles and don't buy plastic ones and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't use your straws anymore, all this stuff. But if it's not regulated by a higher power, if it's not like Starbucks taking on not using straws anymore, that's amazing. Which, which they still do, yes, but like trying to change, <laughs> trying to change not to do that, that is an example. Not offering, um, I was at a restaurant and I wasn't offered a straw and I was like, can I, I was like, I, can I get a straw? And they're like, yeah, we don't give them to people unless they ask. It's stuff like that, you know what I mean? But if if it was just one individual that was like, oh no, I don't want to, I don't want a straw today. Do you see the difference? That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that like we can't make a difference within ourselves, but. Thank you. I feel like to get it to that higher level, it starts with us because the one person that asked for that straw, they uh, question why they were asking for that straw, mm -hmm. and like, I. I get the corporate thing, but the way that the thoughts have to get there is from us making the change, like how he said with like the norms and stuff. I feel like if we change the normalization of like doing the same things, if we change that, I feel like it would get to that level to where everyone tags along kind of thing. It's like a food chain reaction. Well, and, and we can do both, right? I mean yeah, we can change right, both exactly. Things, so yeah. Yeah. Actually, really quick, the motivation sure. There was one up there first, I think. Uh, I totally like agree with what she said at the higher power, uh, but uh, I'm just thinking about the higher power, what they could do like within me. Like I know I, I won't stop eating meat, and so like I'm just thinking about like I don't I don't think it's gonna be any change. I think it's already gonna happen. Like what what do I, I just want to know what we're gonna be able to do right now that's gonna actually help us still eat meat, still do that, and like what's the solutions? That's all. Well, I mean I think that the thing is is like if the answer is how can we stop global warming and not change, we can't. That's it. There's, you can't do it. So if we do everything we're doing right now, we have clear, like, CO2 is going up. So if it's like, hey, I can't stop eating meat, or I'm, I'm going to keep driving my car, well, then it's not going to change, right? 
And so the, there's, there's a lot of big factors, or I'm going to keep voting for the people that I vote for. So at some point, we're going to have to, and, and the costs are going to come back to us. We're already paying for it, right? So when we re rebuilt New Orleans, when we rebuilt New Jersey, now we're going to send money to Nebraska because of their flooding, which all of those are things we should do. If people get hurt, it's good for us to try to fix that. That's our tax money that's, that's happening, right? The next major record-breaking tornado that rips through Illinois because it's enhanced by climate change, we're going to be the ones that are going to have to rebuild whatever town in Illinois gets nailed, right? So the costs are happening, and we're, we just have to choose how do we want to pay and what are the trade-offs that we can make. And so, like, I mean, we all, like, our American diet, number one, so to get back to the meat thing, it's super unhealthy for us, right? Um, so one day a week, try not to have it. There's a ton of options. There's a lot of things you can do that are still really unhealthy and really tasty and will still put cholesterol in your blood um, without eating meat. So, I mean, I, trust me, look at me. I, I'm, I, I, I eat vegetarian all the time, and I still need to lose, like, 80 pounds. So it's, it's doable. Um, you can still be American overweight and eat without meat. But we just have to choose. Like, if the, if the thing is like, hey, well, I don't want to change, well, then that's the answer. We're not going to change. So, I think, yeah. So, good. I, thank you for that comment, though, because I think that's, a, that's where we are. That's the challenge. Yeah, yeah uh, I completely agree with what you said about uh, we need to have someone out with, like, in a higher power to be able to do something. Like, I remember when I was a kid and Michelle Obama had that National Day of Play where she said, turn off your TV for one hour and go outside and play. That was to battle childhood obesity. So, if we had Michelle Obama come back again yeah. and say, all right, all right. <laughs> everyone, for, for one day, don't use your car. I would not use my car if Michelle Obama said so, you know, because, like, that's, like, a big figure, you know what I mean? Or we have someone, like, like uh, as high up as her, like, like go out and publicly say something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Troy Thompson telling me not to eat meat for one day. Does that work? Does that work? <laughs> I think it's just a matter of how you look at it. Like, people always see these things as, like, a hassle or a sacrifice, and it's, like, in not really, like, I, when I was going to a different school, it's like I was away from home for a while. We didn't recycle there. Like, I was used to just taking out the trash like three or four times a week, which is ridiculous because it's like it's only me and my sister home. How are we filling this trash can every other day? But it's like while I was at school, it's like, yeah, I had a lot of stuff to do, but like literally to like walk to the recycling bin, it was on my way to the bus stop. And it's like, that thing that was like a hassle or that I thought would make me late, it's, it's really, you just have to like, it's five minutes. It's five minutes you can do to like just dust off some stuff, just toss it in the recycling bin. Or don't, or like get a salad instead of the hamburger or get loaded cheese fries without bacon. <laughs> Um, so I, I can relate to certain ideas like the, the meat in particular thing. I, th I think realistically right now I don't eat that much meat because I just don't buy it out of coincidence. But it's not something that long term I see myself wanting to do. What are the different options? I, I'm, I'm a believer in climate change. I don't see any reason 97% of scientists who are not really incentivized to prove this thing are going to lie. I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but what are some of the main root causes so people can kind of work with themselves creatively with their own personal preferences and knowing? So is it, you know, is car emissions a main massive primary thing? What are some of the primary ways we can do it? Because I don't, I don't buy into the idea that it's going to be an easy fix. Behavioral change is very difficult. So I would like whatever I undertake to have the highest yield possible. Yeah, yeah good, good question. Probably Stephanie and Don are probably more knowledgeable on that than I am. Chime in when you want. Um, uh, primary causes are fossil fuels, right? So our individual cars, as much as we, um, whenever we say like, oh, if you don't eat meat for a day, that's the equivalent of taking 100,000 cars off the road for one year, big deal. Uh, honestly, I mean, cars, yes, we, sh we should be more efficient with our cars and they are getting more and more efficient. But it's the, it's the high powered uh, coal manufacturing, um, that kind of fossil fuel use that we're doing, the mining for it, the energy it takes to put, uh, to create that disposable plastic water bottle that you have, the shipping and the receiving, the big ships that come from China to America and back to China or India or whatever, all of that, those are the major contributors um, from what I've learned. And so when we think about what is it we can do is one, uh, it's come up a little bit, vote, 
make sure you know who you're voting for, um, that are going to make policies, that are going to put emissions limitations on these things, right? Um, and stay informed. And part of this whole conversation was about information literacy. Sometimes people post quality articles on Facebook. However, sometimes it's just blah, <laughs> right? It's nothing. It's just noise. And we need to block out the noise, and we need to use the right resources. So if you see something that incites you, like Troy said, makes you feel really angry, makes you feel really happy, stop. Go look for more information. Don't make it personal, that kind of thing. So those are things that you can do. Right, yes, we can make those simple choices, bring your reusable bags, you know, use your reusable cups, all of those things. But, um, you know, it's also about our purchasing power. And, you know, do we encourage uh, Old Navy to keep making $10 t-shirts for us in, in factories that, you know, don't treat their people very well? And then pollute, they don't have the same kinds of rules that we do? There's choices we can make. It's, ha it's hard, we can't do it all, yeah. right? But um, those are the major sources that I know of. So, and, and I think from the information literacy side, it's really interesting because one thing that can happen with this comment, right? So this is, Stephanie's fantastic and is absolutely on target. But when she says, um, us not dry, or us not eating meat is just like a drop in the bucket, that becomes an excuse for us. That's what I worry about, right? That becomes an information crutch for us. Where now it's like, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm, gonna dry, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do this because my impact is nothing. But it's not nothing. We have impact. And so even if we do it one, 100, what was 100,000 cars? Uh, that was a, a guess. Yeah. I so, I, I mean, that's still know, so 100,000 cars. <laughs> like, it's still a thing, right? And so we need to do both. So the Obama administration put through legislation through the EPA to limit um, CO2 from coal fire power plants. The, the Trump administration has wiped that all away. So there's things we can do, right? Like who do you vote for and what do you, why, right? That's one level, but also we still have impact by how we, the decisions that we make. And wh one more uh, comment. Then well we're, we're yeah, and up. that's what I wanted to speak to is you can start small. And that's about 15 years ago, my husband and I did that. And every year we talked about it. And instead of doing, there's a really good book and um, uh, I think there's also a movie with it, but No Impact Man, which is here in the library. And instead of doing it cold turkey like he did, what we started doing was one new thing each year. So that now for two adults and three pets, we have less than one kitchen garbage can of garbage a week um, that's not recyclable. And But it, we didn't get there overnight. We've done one like one thing a year. This year we're on a gasoline diet. And that's been really interesting. Which also saves money, right? Yes, it does. Okay. I didn't try, just to clarify, I didn't mean to minimize the impacts of <laughs> s individual um, actions. Please, that's not what I was trying to say. I'm j I was answering your question, what is the biggest contribution? Uh, but we all are individuals, and we can definitely do individual actions like Don said. I encourage you to do so. I myself am a vegetarian, so at least I'm taking 10 cars off the road. I don't know how many exactly. but. Um, you know, information literacy, find out the real facts. That's how Troy got up with this, uh, this whole presentation, right? He's not a climate scientist, right? But he did his research, and he found true facts, and he cross-checked, and he cross-checked, and cross-checked, and we had conversations about it. And then he taught you about how we reason, because he's also read psychology, and you have psychology professors here who would have spoken up if he wasn't saying the right thing. Right, Mitch? <laughs> and then, you know, helped you kind of think through how do you feel and then how do you reason. So that's the whole point of this, but also hoping from sustainability perspective that you take something away about climate change and, and try to make some change. So thank okay. you, Troy. Thank you all. Have a good day.